Here's today's question. What can save America? Now, you may be listening or watching and say, what's wrong with America? Why does America need to be saved? I would venture a guess, though, if I had to make a guess, that if you're watching this or listening to this right now, you're someone who also views other news. You look at the things that are happening in not only our world, but more specifically our country. I believe that you're probably someone who loves freedom and loves America and loves the history of our country. And if you're anything like me, like the person I just described, then you're someone that looks at all of the things that are happening. I mean, we could talk about stuff that's happening in Washington and things that are happening in little communities and large cities across our country. Things that don't make sense to us, conversations we have never in our history had about things like uh, gender and equality and what it means to be equal and whether or not we should force equality on other people. Uh, these strange conversations that we have and, and uh, we could go on and on and on and on. And if you're like me, you look at these things and you look down the road a little bit and ask yourself, how is this all going to work out? This is not the America that I remember from my childhood. If you're a parent, perhaps you look at this and think something like this. This is not the America I want for my kids. And if we find ourselves at this place now, where will America be when our kids and our grandkids and their kids grow up? And what kind of world will they find themselves living in? These are all really important questions. As a parent, as the father of four children, I ask myself these questions all of the time. All of this in my mind kind of comes together and it boils down into this one kind of big thought, this big question, the question I started with, what can save America? Now, I believe, and I hope that you do as well, that when we look at the world around us and we look at the things that are happening, particularly the things that we don't understand and the things that we don't agree with, instead of finding ourselves in a place of fear and anxiety over what might be, we need to evaluate those things and step back and ask this question, what can I do about what's happening in the world around me? I have tried more and more in my life to ask that question. What can I do with the information that I have? What can I do with the things that I see and the things that I understand and all of the things that are going on around me? What can I do about these things? So when I then ask the question, what can save America? I really need to ask, how can I help <laughs> to save America? Now, I believe America is a great nation. I believe, uh, really, that it's a nation that God has used around the world for the cause of freedom, both religious freedom and physical freedom and political freedom. I believe that God has used America. I believe it's clear that America has been really special in the course of human history. Things have happened here that have happened nowhere, and freedoms have taken place here and been birthed here that have really never been seen at any other point in history. America is special, and it's always been special, and I believe it will always be special. But if we want to preserve the ideals of America, preserve those ideals that our country was founded upon and that we hope to hang on to, those ideals that we really think about when we consider the country that we live in, we need to ask the question, what can save America, and then really get down to kind of the brass tacks, if you will. We need to put some things in place that we can get our hands around, those things that we can control, and begin to be a part of the solution. I believe that America is great and that America will continue to be great, but I believe that America will continue to be great when Americans take the responsibility for the greatness of this country personally. I want to give you some thoughts today as we talk about this for just a moment. And again, I hope this is as important to you as it is to me. I believe, and, and I really do, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, then this is important to you. So what do we do? How do we participate in the continuing greatness of America? A couple of thoughts for you, and again, I hope that these help you. Here's the first one. We need to live and help others to live on a foundation of faith. Now, this isn't a, a religious program, all right? This is not religious programming. <laughs> but we need to understand the importance of faith, not only in the founding of our country, but in the continuing greatness of our country. 
I think that much of what we've lost in the United States and so much of why we ask the questions about what's happening and this confusion around so many of these things that are going on, uh, it goes back to a lack of a faith foundation. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know where it is, but somewhere along the line, uh, we have decided, I don't think it was you, I don't think it was me, but we collectively, Americans, have decided that we can do America, (laughs) we can have the freedom, that we can be a sovereign nation without a faith foundation. And yet, if we understand our history at all, we know that the founders of the United States, those founding fathers, the people who penned the words to the Declaration of Independence, and then put their collective minds together to give us that great document that leads us the Constitution. These were men of faith. Now, They may not have necessarily shared your views on faith or my views on faith. Some would have and others may not have entirely. But they understood this truth. That the freedoms we enjoy as America are unalienable. They cannot be taken away. Why? Because they were given to us by God. All men are created equal by God. That's something that the government has not given to us, nor can it therefore take away. They understood that in order for our nation to continue to be great, it must be built on a foundation of faith. What does faith do? Now, we could speak of specific faith systems and specific uh, types of church or religious denominations. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this, understanding that faith and that foundation, it allows us to elevate our view beyond the things that are happening around us. Here's one of the problems that we're experiencing in the United States of America today. (laughs) Most people look at the world and ask this question. How does what's happening right now affect me? That's the wrong question to ask. What we need to do is look at the world around us from a position of faith, understanding that this country has been here much longer than we have and will be here long after we're gone. But even beyond that, the the world that our country exists within has been here much, much longer than even our country has been here, and it will go on long after America rises or falls or whatever it is that will happen with America. We have to then step back even one step further and understand that all of this thing was started by a God who's bigger than all of it. You see, a faith foundation means that we're operating from a position where we understand we are not the center of the universe. That the United States is not the center of the universe. That not even the world that the United States exists on is the center of the universe. That God is the center of the universe, and that God has a plan, and that God is in control. So regardless of what happens in our little world, our little corner of the world, it's not the complete picture. There's more to it. We stand on a foundation of faith. Now what happens when you stand on a foundation of faith? You realize that laws are not relative, that morals and character are not relative, that there is a standard that the one in whom we place our faith establishes the standard. So standards of right and wrong, of ethics, standards of uh, what defines a man and a woman, what defines and how do we understand correct behavior. These are not things that are relative to us. They're not things that we get to decide that there is a standard and we simply need to align our lives to that standard. You see, in order to save America, we need to get back to understanding that we have to operate from a foundation of faith. Faith is where it begins. I believe there's a second part, and these two are connected, and it's this. We stand on a foundation of faith, but we need to live in a principled way. So we talk about how to save America. And again, I know this is big language, but how can we do our part to make sure that America goes forward? Well, we live on a foundation of faith, but then we operate in a principled way. You see, when you have a foundation that is faith, you then make a decision to live according to that faith. That is principled living. Listen, (laughs) here's what happens. People get married and they 
decide they don't like the person they're married to anymore. And so the easy thing is to get away. And so they get away. That's not principled living. That's emotional living. It's selfish living. It's about me. And so it is in other relationships. We consider uh, the ideas of right and wrong and, and ask the question, who gets to decide this? If you get to decide this, you're going to make the wrong decision. Principled living says, I'm going to do what is right because I stand on a position or a foundation of faith, regardless of how I feel about what's happening. There was a story in the news recently about uh, a man who bought a couch at a thrift store. Maybe you heard this story, a uh, crazy story. Bought a couch at a thrift store. What had happened is the grandson of a man who died was clearing out his grandfather's house and found this couch and took it through to a thrift store. Someone else came along and they bought the couch, they took it home, and they discovered as they were setting it all up that hidden inside the cushions of this couch was something like $40,000. I don't know the exact amount, something like that. Now, I don't know what you would have done if you found $40,000 in the cushions of a couch you just bought from a thrift store, <laughs> but I think a lot of us would just look both ways, make sure no one was watching, and then go out and buy the thing we actually wanted. But you know what this man did? Great story. He went back to the thrift store, he did some investigation, found out who had donated that piece of furniture, went and found that person, and gave him the money, understanding it must have been given or donated in error. The grandson who was cleaning out his grandfather's house said he had no idea that his grandfather hid his money in that couch. You know what that is? That's an example of principled living. That's someone who could have gotten away with doing something that is kind of on the fringes. He could have justified it away. But instead he said, no, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I'm going to live my life according to what I know to be true and right. And as Americans, we have to get back to the place where we understand that life is to be lived in a principled way. That there are absolutes, that there is right and there is wrong. And we're going to live according to those things. There's a foundation of faith, and that foundation says, uh, life is bigger than me. Uh, there is the decision to live in a principled way. Uh, that, if I could sum it up, is this. I'm going to do the right thing regardless of what that means to me personally. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be a principled person. I'm going to love when I'm not loved. I'm going to do right at work, even when they're not necessarily doing right to me. I'm going to be an ethical person. I'm going to do the right thing because it's right to do. Well, that's the second thing. Can you imagine a society where that was the prevailing thought? I'm going to do right regardless of what happens. There's a third part to this, and this is where we come in. I think that individually we need to decide to get back to a foundation of faith, to not looking at the world in terms of ourselves, but understanding uh, there's a God, a creator who's bigger than all of this, and there is an absolute standard, and I'm going to just understand that standard so that I can live a principled life according to that standard. And those are important things to do, but, but check this out. Here it is. <laughs> Here's what we can do. This is the last thing. We need to be committed to having a mentor mindset, a mentor mindset. I've got uh, kids, I have two younger kids, but then I have two older kids, a 20 year old and an 18 year old. And kids, if you have them, you know this to be true, they will drive you nuts sometimes, right? They just drive you crazy. <laughs> but you love them at the same time. What's been interesting to me in my lifetime has, to, has been to hear the discussion by people my age about younger people coming along. Man, it's as if we believe that everyone who's 10 years or more younger than us cannot possibly figure out how to tie their shoes or hold down a job. <laughs> we talk about millennials like they are the spawn of Satan. We don't know where they came from, but they need to go back to wherever it is they came from. They're ruining our country. <laughs> We talk about those who are younger than us as people who cannot possibly figure out how to carry this thing forward. I wonder if our grandparents talked about us that way. Maybe they did. I don't know. Here's what I do know. What I do know is that if the next generation is going to understand the importance of having a faith foundation, and they're going to understand what it is to live a principled life, they're going to do it because people who are a little further down the road than them have a mentor mindset. 
What we do most of the time is we evaluate what's happening in terms of how it impacts us. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. A mentor mindset says this, I need to evaluate what's happening. I need to do my best to understand it. And then I need to provide the appropriate context for those who are coming up behind us. I need to demonstrate what it is to live a principled life. I need to talk about what it is to live a principled life. I need to speak about freedom and why that's important and and all of the things that we value. We need to look around and ask this question, how can I help those who are around me to understand these essential truths? That's so important. This, uh, This week, earlier this week, there was a rally, we'll call it a march, (laughs) in Richmond, Virginia. Again, if you're following the news, you you know all about this, but we're told, and here's the numbers, somewhere between 20,000 and (laughs) 110,000. How's that for a a wide margin, right? I think it depends on which side of the aisle you're on. But somewhere between 20,000 and just over 100,000 Second Amendment advocates went to Richmond, Virginia and kind of marched their way to the state's capital in protest of coming or at least proposed gun legislation. The legislature in the state of Virginia, it's such a crazy story, but they've decided that they need to control gun rights. They need to remove one of the essential elements of the Constitution of the United States. They need to take away gun ownership. Now, a lot of stuff with that, I understand that. But here's what happened. Several thousand, tens of thousands of gun owners stood up showed up on the same day and crowded into a very small space. Many of them, and again, if you watch the news, you've seen the pictures, many of them were carrying firearms across their body or over their shoulders. What was fascinating about this march was that the prediction was this, those folks would be white supremacists, they would be there, they would cause problems, buildings would burn down, arrests would be made, and it would be mayhem in the streets. That was the prediction. Here's what happens. Here's what happened. Men, women, and children of all races, of all backgrounds, wealthy, not so wealthy, everything in between, these people showed up. It wasn't a white supremacist rally. It was a rally for people that love America and love freedom. They showed up carrying firearms. There were tens of thousands of firearms at this rally. And you know what happened? Not one building was burned down. I believe throughout the entire day, one arrest was made. There weren't fights in the streets. Police were not assaulted. It was a peaceful demonstration by people that love freedom and wanted to make their voice and their position known. That's what happened. It's crazy. If you get the chance, go and find the video of these Second Amendment supporters (laughs) when the rally was over with weapons slung over their shoulders, carrying large black plastic bags and cleaning up the mess that they had left. Not only did they rally in numbers of the multiple thousands carrying firearms, it was a peaceful rally that they cleaned up afterwards. There's so much that can be said about that. Here's what I'll say about it. You know what that is? That's a group of people who have a mentor mindset. They didn't go there to cause problems or to unnecessarily do something that would get attention for themselves. What they did is they said this. They said that freedom is important. The only way to maintain our freedoms is to maintain the right to keep and bear arms as given to us in the Second Amendment of the Constitution. They wanted to make their voice heard, and they did. And they demonstrated to our entire nation the right way to do it. We have the freedom in the United States to redress our grievances to our government. That's one of the things that makes us different than many other nations around the world. And these folks did it in the right way. And what they did was demonstrated to a lot of other people how they could also do it in the right way. That's a mentor mindset. Let me tell you this. There are a lot of things that we can do. And most of us are consumed with getting from one end of this thing we call life to the other end. Here's how you save America. (laughs) or at least participate in the saving of America, here's what you do. You understand that your life is to be lived on a foundation of faith, that you're going to be a principled person, someone that's going to do right because it's right to do, regardless of the consequences to you personally, and you're going to turn around 
And you're going to find someone who's a a little bit younger than you, a little bit uh, further back on the road than you are right now. And you're going to mentor them. You're going to teach them. You're going to provide an example that they can follow. You're going to help them to understand why these things are important. You know what I did last night at dinner (laughs) with my little kids? We talked about the march in Richmond, Virginia. Why? Because I want them to understand why that's important. Interestingly, the march happened on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, (laughs) a day we celebrate civil rights. We should celebrate how appropriate that was, and that worked its way into the conversation I had with my kids about what it was those folks back in the 60s were marching for. They were marching for basic human rights. (laughs) Someone needed to stand up and do that, and they did it. They were marching for the same things that the folks yesterday were marching for in Richmond, Virginia. Basic human rights. The ability to defend yourself. The ability to maintain something given to us by God. Not the guns, but the freedom. (laughs) We need to have these conversations. And as mentors, we need to stop looking at the world in terms of ourselves and instead look around and say, who can I help? Who can I teach? Who can I cheer for? Who can I get behind? And how can I ensure that the next generation of uh, Americans understand where we came from and where we should be going? I love America. I would imagine, again, if you're watching this or listening to this, you love America too. And if you love America, sometimes you look at the things that are happening in this America and it causes you uh, great anxiety, (laughs) maybe even a little bit of fear. You wonder what in the world is going to happen down the road. Listen to me, you can't control everything. You can't make things happen. You can't undo what others believe all of the time. But you can live your life on a foundation of freedom. You can decide to do right because it's the right thing to do. And in doing those two things, you can mentor those who are coming behind you and show them the way. You'd be surprised how many young Americans just need someone to show them the way. I'm hopeful because I believe Americans will always rise to the challenge. I appreciate you listening. Again, if you are listening somewhere, other than YouTube, go to YouTube. You can subscribe. I would love to have you subscribe there. Hit the notification bell, share this out, and get it to as many folks as possible. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time.